Jeff. Brent. Next to last episode. I can't wait. For We're it. so here. I can't wait for either one of them. Jeff, I hate you so much. You should. I hate you. Should. you. I hate you. I hate you so much. You know, you hate me, and you should. You're right to hate me. <laughs> but you know, you know who I love? Sorry, I'm adjusting my camera here. I've been talking about this now for like, I don't know, 40 weeks or something like that. Right, right. No one that I saw in comments yeah. and tweets gave it away. Yeah, good, Thank good you. call. That's right. That is, we, you know, I think it was last week or whatever, I talked about how we have a hard time verbalizing like the whole no spoiler thing or whatever. And it's stuff that gets in. Yeah. We've been exposed to spoilers, but we don't have the context, you know, for it to make sense mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Yeah. So it's like, okay, you know, minimal collateral damage. But someone could have popped in and been like, uh, actually, uh, Anna Sheridan comes back in blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you idiot. Like, but no one that I saw yeah. did that. Yeah. And it's going to be huge. Like, I, I want to get through this just to get to the next one because I want to see just how right I am. Well, like, well, Jeff, you said it. Uh, let's do it. Guys, what you guys out there are about to watch is Jeff and I recording the audio podcast of Babylon 5 for the very first time. We have now watched the episode Shadow Dancing, the penultimate episode of season three. And Jeff and I are going to talk about it. You guys out there are getting all the behind the scenes. This is how we bake the pie. This is how we grill the hot dogs. This is how we... Cut Toss the cheese. The pizza. No, you don't cut the... Jeff! I, I cut cheese? What? Amateur. No? Listen, just push the button and stop, okay? <laughs> First time. You're new here, or Someday, somewhere, I'll make a difference. It's a mockery. I mean, we're not some, some deep space franchise. This station is about something. The year is 2023. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time. Welcome to Babylon 5, for the first time, not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I am watching and loving Babylon 5, for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5, for the first time Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters who are watching the series for the very first time. And we are looking for what we call the Star Trek like messages embedded within this non Star Trek show and trying to decide just how much we like it. And because we hail from Star Trek, those references are sure to make their way into our discussions. So to keep us focused on Babylon 5, you know, more than the incredible show already does, we play the rule of three. That means each one of us gets up to three references to Star Trek per episode. That's it. Three. One of those three. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. <laughs> hey, Brett. Hey, Jeff. We have... A five star review. Oh, yes. We're back to Apple Podcasts this week, and S. Boyle says the last best hope for first timers. Each week, I look forward to hearing the exploration of my favorite show by the Star Trek <laughs> veterans. They go into this not knowing anything about the show, bringing back my first viewing memories. The only difference is we weren't expecting consequences. They, they've been warned. I'm nearly at the end of season one already, and I believe they are fully on board. But without actually spoiling anything, they've only seen the foundation for the building site stripped. By making sure the viewer knows this isn't Star Trek, <laughs> and the foundations have been dug and poured. The building with all its rooms is yet is yet but a dream. So enjoy the wild guesses and admire the deduction of these guys as they wander around the site in their high viz. Was going to say red shirts. <laughs> That's buzz number three, and I'm out. But hoping these guys last the full five seasons. Great show. Keep it up. Well, uh, we are here at the end of season three. Jeff, what do you think? We got two more in us? Maybe. I think Maybe. we're going to make it. I think we're going to make, you know what I love Jeff. I, I mean, we are here at the end of season three and I don't, I don't know when that, that 
you know, review came in or, or email came in. Um, but there are still people finding this show. Yeah, that's a pretty new review and going in the all scope. the way back to the beginning and not just jumping in with where we are. They're going all the way back to the beginning to catch up. And, and we, we do get those emails of people who are like, Hey, let's talk about Sinclair and how you guys keep bagging on the actor, Michael O'Hare. <laughs> and we're like, please just keep listening. Please. We're please. there. We get there. We yeah. get there. And, and, and that, that, by the way, that's not annoying to me. That's just them being where they are in their watch through. And that's totally cool. And I'm like, just keep watching. You'll be, you'll, you, we'll get there. <laughs> we gotcha. I love when people write us emails or messages or reviews where they buzz themselves. It, yes. That's always that's hilarious. Yeah. Super fun. Yeah. Well, Hey, we have another five star review. Oh, yes. Also from Apple podcasts, Havermonk from Norway says, Nothing like B5 through fresh eyes. Having seen all of B5 more than 20 times across the years, and yes, I counted, few things come closer to experiencing it for the first time, like listening to someone else doing just that. This is pure dopamine in podcast form. A few episodes in, these guys felt like old friends that don't know I am stalking them. And listening to their speculations and analysis is a lot of fun. Looking forward to the rest of this awesome journey with you. You know what? You don't have to stalk us. You can actually like come introduce yourself to us. You sent the, yeah. you sent the review. You can send us in emails. Uh, you can do the comments down below, but you know where you re if you really want to talk to us and like, just kind of hang out and talk about stuff that might have something to do with the show might actually have nothing to do with the show and just get to know Jeff and I like on a personal level our discord page, which is available through our Patreon page. Um, and yes, this is a hundred percent, a shameless plug, but also, <laughs> um, an invitation to come join us guys. It's a lot of fun. There's a really, a lot of really cool relationships that we formed true friendships with people yeah. from all around the world. Yeah. Um, it's great. And another way to make sure that you're staying in touch with us, just like Havermonk did, just like S Boyle did. In two weeks, two weeks, Brent, we are wrapping up season three of Babylon five. And as we've done with seasons one and two, we're going to have a big wrap up show. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about a lot of really cool things, but to you, the listener, the viewer, what you want to care about outside of the great content that we're committed to bringing you week after week. And if you're not watching us on YouTube, pop over right here and you'll see the star theory that was 3d printed by wash a little while ago, actually quite some time ago, but we've been holding on to this for a while. You send us a review that comes in. You're going to be automatically entered to receive one of two of these star theories. That's right. There are two opportunities for you to win one of these. So get in a review, get it in as soon as you possibly can. I'm going to run our little like review report and make sure I've got it all fresh in two weeks time, just before we go on mic. And then we'll be selecting two winners to get one of those cool, incredible star theories. And I'm, I'm going to make a, an ask of the, the folks who receive these, um, these are unpainted. So like you can actually still paint these and I feel like I'm holding it upside down. Um, but whatever they're spaceships, there's no right side up or like, well, it's whichever it way the person in it is sitting, but you're, you're, you're all right. Uh, but anyway, you know, one of the things they do for the star Furies in the show is they like paint the top with something that's like unique. Uh, I want to see you paint this thing and then send us a picture of whatever you put. Uh, I, I want to see the painted version of these things. Yeah. That'd be super cool. Well, Jeff, uh, you know, we love so many different things that we get to do here. We play the role of three. We get to read reviews from super cool folks out there. We get to do giveaways and, and promote that. One of the other things we get to do is at the end of the show, we play a game where it's honestly a highlight of the show. We try to predict what the next week's episode is going to be based on title alone. And this is the part of the show where we look back at last week and try to decide if what we predicted last week that this week was going to be about, were we correct or not? So Jeff, do you remember what you said? shadow dancing was going to be about and how close were you 
So I was kind of right on part of it. I thought this was really going to be about building up their fleet. And I thought, though, that it was going to be leading to the big battle with the shadows yeah. that was you know kind of set up last time. We got the buildup of the fleet and the kind of politics around that and what was happening. But I thought that the focus of this episode was going to be Ivanova's latent uh, telepathy mm. and either feelings of inadequacy or unlocking an untapped um kind of power within that that was not even mentioned in this one whatsoever i don't know the last time we mentioned ivanova's latent telepath i know is it not a thing anymore like was that just for the talia just something stuff, that maybe? got dropped you know um i don't know it didn't get dropped nothing gets dropped in babylon yeah. 5 hey listen nothing there's still one more episode of season uh three left and season four and five are still on deck so yeah there are 45 more episodes and some movies so maybe it comes up maybe maybe or maybe what not. did you think uh i said that this was going to be um the shadows uh taking some losses like with the telepath thing going on and the new fleet of white starships that the shadows are are just uh getting hit and so they have to change their tactics in order to gain the upper hand of the war um not really at all what this one was about not really at all like there's there's shadows and a little bit of war stuff but that's really yeah so i i did i didn't i'm not gonna give myself any credit for this one um but jeff for those who are listening out there who didn't watch this one first coming into this episode um or maybe they've never seen it ever and they're just listening to us anyway which is dope uh, why don't you tell the folks out there how this episode actually went down? We catch up with Dr. Franklin on his walkabout. And to be honest here, it does not look to be going that well. Mm. He's sleeping under an army coat while huddled on the ground, which is basically the universal signal for things aren't good. The family of an apparent candidate for your local school board is walking through down below with a tourist flyer because I guess guess down below is a tourist destination now but franklin shows his humanity as he connects with their poor poor daughter ever the hero though he hears someone getting mugged and dives in for the rescue to thank him for his troubles he gets stabbed in the gut from a legit crocodile dundee style knife like for real this knife is no joke that's not a knife this is a knife yeah, seriously, that, I think it might be the knife that Paul, Ho Paul Hogan used. That thing was massive. By the way, if you don't know what Jeff's talking about, you need to go watch the movie Crocodile Dundee. Jeff, we should do a watch of Crocodile Dundee just because we said that. Right? Go ahead. We're going to wait for uh, my wife to pull out of the garage. Oh, I hear it. I don't know if you can, yeah. okay, I say, I don't know if you can hear that, but there it is. We got to wait for the car to actually go out of the garage and for the garage yeah. to shut. Yet again. School starts this week for uh, for us. So oh. my daughter is out uh, wrapping up like the last like, oh, it's we're going back. They have a little play play thing with some of her some of her friends. So awesome. We started a couple weeks ago and uh, I got to tell you, so we we homeschool our kids yeah. and you know what conversation we never have to have in our house. Come on, it's time, time to, to get up. up. Let's go, let's yeah. go, get up, get out of bed. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And uh, I'm just, I'm laughing at all my friends. Like I've heard from so many friends who are like, what happened this summer? Like nobody's, you know, it's so hard to get them out of bed. And I'm just like, ha, ha, ha. And then we're also done before everybody else gets out of school too, so. Yeah. Yeah, and you're, you have a, someone knocking on being a preteen. So like oh, getting he, him no, to wake there's up. there's no knocking. He is. He is, he is fully in that mode and conversations are happening that i was like oh. oh they're coming and now they're here i'm just thinking about how like there's 24 hours a day and he's gonna sleep 23 and a half of them i would kind of be okay with that <laughs> to be honest with you <laughs> all right back to it bleeding out alone his dream comes true and he meets himself himself is not very nice but himself is very honest. He helps Franklin understand that he has run away from everything his entire life, always looking for the easy path. So if he wants to run away from life, 
now's the time. But if he wants to go again, and yes, he literally asks him in this, what do you want? It's a little on the nose in Babylon 5. But Franklin 1, the stabbed Franklin, says that he wants to give it another go. He wants to do it again, and he wants to do better. So the not stabbed Franklin spews a bunch of super toxic masculinity at him. So he gets up, climbs up a ladder into the marketplace where he can get carted off to med lab and be saved. Barely. But remember that because we are not done with the doctor. Delenn and Sheridan are ready to strike. They know where the shadows are heading and this is a huge opportunity for them. But even with the new white stars, they need more ships. The shadows are an overwhelming force. Delenn is pleading with the league worlds for ships. They play some politics, but eventually they come around. So the plan is to send Marcus and Ivanova or Ivanova in the white star to patrol the, uh, to, to patrol the area the attack will happen in so they can alert the waiting fleet. With some time to kill between prepping ships and getting the White Star on patrol, Delenn tells Sheridan that they're going to sleep together. Well, they're going to spend the night together. It, well, actually, Sheridan is going to sleep while Delenn channels her inner Zathras and belts out an old Earth classic. Every move you make, every step you take, I'll be watching you. Yeah. Minbari ladies like just stare at their suitors while they sleep <laughs> so they can see their true face or something. But hey, Sheridan seems into it, so good on them. That's great. Marcus and Ivanova swap watch rotations while Ivanova tries to figure out the weird angled Minbari beds. Honest question for everybody out there listening or watching, because I know this fan community. Have any of you tried this? Have you tried like angling your bed and sleeping like that? Let us know. Tweet us. Let us know in the comments. I want to know how it went because I don't see it going well. Mm. While they talk, Marcus shares that he's fluent in Minbari and he bears his heart to Ivanova, but doesn't translate it for her. Poor guy. And it would have been a good time for him to have done it too because... Here come the shadows, and that might have been his last chance. They blast the shadow scout ship, and it almost looks like it's bleeding in space. But shortly after, a horrifying amount of shadows appear out of nowhere. Just in time, the fleet pops out, and it is on. Pew, 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 boom, boom, boom. The fight rages on, with Sheridan and Delenn commanding the fleet from a super cool room on a Minbari cruiser. The Babylon Five forces are victorious, but at a terrible cost. For every shadow ship destroyed, the B-5 forces lost two. Knowing it's just a matter of time before they strike back, everybody gets to work planning. But before they can really get to work, Sheridan, kind of out of nowhere, shares his vision from way back in early season two. I think the episode was all alone in the night with Delenn and Ivanova. They dream interpret the whole thing, calling out Ivanova's latent telepathy, and apparently, if I understood this correctly, there is a mirror version of Sheridan, an equal and opposite version that is important to the shadows. I think they call him the Intendant. Between this and a few other scenes, we see a teeny tiny little ship pop out of a shadow ship in hyperspace and head towards, I don't know, probably Babylon 5? Well, Franklin, remember the doctor? We talked about him earlier. Well, he's in med lab. He's healing up, but he sees all the casualties pouring in from the battle. And just like before his walkabout, he can't leave well enough alone. And just like before his life-changing experience on his walkabout, he can't trust others to do what they need to do. So he pulls himself into a wheelchair and takes charge of the situation. Sheridan comes in, offers him his job back. Franklin says he's changed and he's going to do better. You see, he met himself and just like Jeff Aiken, he didn't like Dr. Franklin either. Well, Sheridan and Delenn do their thing. Sheridan lies comfortably on his bed, on his back, flat, 
Imagine how weird, honestly, this whole thing would have been in those angled beds. Like, Delenn's just like staring at him and he's kind of staring at her on those things. Whole different take when you put him in the Minbari ones. But she seems to like what she's seen. She meanders over to a table. It has both a snow globe on it and Jeff's absolutely ingenious prediction from way back in season two. In a scene that we just saw a few weeks ago, the bedroom door slides open and a woman pops in. She says, hi, I'm Melissa Gilbert, Bruce Boxleitner's wife, and Delenn drops the snow globe. But Jeff's prediction rises from the table, causing a rewind of the scene. And then she actually says, hi, I'm Anna Sheridan, John's wife. And the prediction explodes in a fury of lights and confetti. Brent, were you shadow dancing through this one or shadow boxing? I'm not sure I was shadow anything through this episode. <laughs> uh, God, I thought it's going to, oh, now everybody's going to comment. Brent doesn't understand. Um, you don't understand subtlety nor nuance. Right, right, right. Just, uh, yeah. I don't understand character arcs or narrative story flow or. Yeah. Uh, you know, which absolutely accounts for why I've been able to predict like 50% of the show before it ever happens. Whatever. Here's the thing. I am so tired of Franklin's walkabout story that I am glad it has finally come to a conclusion. At the same time, I am glad that that wasn't a one episode story. Like they let him sit in it for a while, but it was time to wrap that storyline up because I just. I, I didn't care about it anymore, especially after last week with him sitting in the corner with the DTs, you know, rocking back and forth. Um, personally, though, Jeff, I loved the Franklin stuff. Did you really? In this episode. I really did. I loved the, what was it, Superman 2, Superman 3-esque? 2, Superman 2. Superman yeah. 2, where, uh, you know, they're kind of not really beating each other up, but, you know, they're they're facing each other, and, and you know, it's two halves, and... You know, the, the one Franklin, the, the, the ghost Franklin, whatever we're going to call him, he was saying to the real Franklin, like, I felt like he was speaking for me. He was saying everything that the other guy needed to hear. This is mm -hmm. who you are. This is where you've been. This is what you've been doing. This is why you've been doing it. This is why you're stupid. And you need to get over it. And it was, it was that hard nose, tough love, but coaching and calling you to be better. And at first you just thought it was being jerky McJerk face until bloodied up Franklin, like starts trying to climb up the wall. It's like, I want it. I want to do it again. I want to do over, which was a little cheesy, but he turns and he's like, put one hand in front of another go get it. Do you really want it? Do like, I was like, yes, that's where he was going with all of that. And then, uh, and I may be in a different spot than you than this whole deal. When, when Franklin is at the end of the episode and he's finally stepping back into being who he is, his best self, mm -hmm. I didn't see it as him coming in and just not being able to leave well enough alone and not being able to trust people but he saw a, a massive confusion and a place where he could step in and lend his strength to bring calm and to bring order. And he did that without being able to lift a finger. He had to do it from a wheelchair. He had to let his people go do it without him being the one to go do it. And then he has this conversation with, with uh, Sheridan. And, and I love this conversation because he's basically repeating everything that he told himself earlier. Mm -hmm. But for the first time I went, you know what? This is the strongest, most confident, self-aware Franklin that we have ever seen on this show. And all of those things that we have hated about Franklin don't seem to be in this guy right here. Okay. And it felt to me like, like this is a Franklin that I want to follow. This is the Franklin uh, that, that I, that I want to want to, uh, have as a CMO, if he can stay like this and, and have his, um, uh, just have his head on straight, you know? Um, I, I loved 
this piece with him. And then even the, the, the last part with Franklin where he rolls over and he's like, whoever taught you how to hold a cauterizer like that. Right. Which is first was like, oh yeah, now he's a jerk. But then he says, he says, let me show you how. And he takes it and he, it's not like he takes it from her and he boxes her out and just does it. He actually, he does the coaching thing where he, he grabs and he's like, no, let me show you where this is. And he's actually turning into a teaching moment for Franklin. And it was a real brief half of a second shot, but, but personally I, I latched onto it and I loved the Franklin stuff. That to me really was the highlight wow. of this well, episode. No, you have to know a thing, right? That, it, that I've been told. Yeah. many times by our community. I have a extreme bias and I'm not capable of seeing the good in Franklin, <laughs> uh, but I have notes right here uh -huh. that echo what you just said, yeah. where in, in my opinion, what we saw of Franklin, when he was kind of there and, and we, this is stuff for us to discuss, but just cause you brought it up, I yeah. want to bring the, my, my point in it was what we saw was the Franklin pre stims. Right. Mm -hmm. Which when he was kind of telling people what to do, I, I am, I'm going to accept like your piece of like, Hey, I can't get up and help people and cauterize wounds and do this stuff. I can't do that, but I can divvy up resources and help bring order to this. But again, he was yelling. He was like, go do it, go make it happen. Like he was just like back to, you know, crisis triage guy who he was all the, and it was a crisis. There was triage. Like mm -hmm. that was the situation. But it's just, he was carrying himself in that same way of I have all the answers, go do what I say now. Yeah. But when he talked to Sheridan, what we can talk about, and then in that moment with yeah. the doctor or the nurse at the end, that those were those glimpses of like, oh, so there's still like, cause, cause you're you're you, right? You're mm -hmm. still you, but he's he's learning, and it's not a a, a switch that gets flipped. Right, like it's right. going to take time, and I think that at the end of the like the literal end of his moment was like oh he is okay yeah. he is he is taking that step right right i think i read that that scene differently than you did um because i i totally understand what you're talking about i just felt the difference was where before he would be like go do this go do this because i'm the best and i know everything and just do what i say to do where this was a person coming in leading lending strength and frankly dropping a little bass in the voice to get mm -hmm. people to move, but not in an overlord commanding way. Okay. In a, in a, in a, a leader, he, he's doing it the right way. That's the way I read it. But I think regardless of that, you and I are at the same spot at the end of the, the yeah, we get to the same place. Yeah. I will tell okay, you, though, sorry, sorry for interrupting. No, it's okay. Uh, I have to ask though, what the heck was that episode with the lounge singer about now? Seriously, if, that was his walkabout. If this is the episode where he meets himself and he has tough questions and he has to go through this process, then what was that about? And this might be a first time that I've ever had, Jeff, an episode that I was kind of high on, that like I, I was digging what they were doing in the show. And then due to a subsequent episode that negates everything that happened there, because that's obviously not it kind of makes me hate that episode. Like I retroactively hate walk about a, a lot more now because of this episode. And I liked this episode. <laughs> well, cause it's, you're right. Cause I mean, and you, I think it was you who stepped through the, the metaphor in that one so beautifully where that was him and they uh -huh. worked, you know, and mirrored his experience and he got to do those things. And that was very artistic and it was well done. And we're like, we were high on it. And then this was really well done. Yeah. Like, Franklin one and Franklin two, like that was, that was good. I wasn't a fan of him doing the whole get up. You piece of garbage. Can you just grab one more wrong blah, blah. That was, you know, pre modern era, toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. I have some fun stories when we talk about it with my toxic self-talk that I still use to this day, yeah. but it was that, but whatever, right? Like it just reminded me of my version. old football coach that I loved. <laughs> totally. Like yeah. that, that's Which coaching, right? Is old toxic masculinity. I don't uh -huh. I, Yeah. I, I don't know that I want to say the word toxic, but it, it is that old, like just hard nosed old school. I kept waiting for him to be like, be a man. Right. Get up. You know, right, he was, right. he was right there. Right. Right. I'm glad he didn't, but yeah. So the other thing, and this, this bothered me, this bothered me a lot. How does Babylon five have any earth civilian tourists on board? 
if we can't get regular news out to the group, who's giving them a passport to go to Babylon five from earth much more than that. Who's taking a self guided walking tour with a map with descriptions on it of the printed s- map of the seediest part of the station. <laughs> who's doing that? Um, like it just, yeah, oh my gosh, it was, uh, uh, um, now the whole part with Marcus and Ivanova and the thing with the shadow ships and the, the, that was in many ways, I think the comic relief of the episode, I thought it was fine. The space war was really cool to watch. Um, I thought, I thought the whole Delenn thing was really, really sweet. The whole Mimbari culture of how they do things also is creepy as hell. You know, and I loved the callback to the, to the, uh, war without end vision. Um, turns out that was just like a couple of weeks away from happening, not years down the road. And Jeff, do you know, when we saw that girl in, in the vision, do you know who I thought it was? Mm-mm. I honestly thought it was another Delenn. Now you oh, had mentioned like a- p- potentially a daughter, but I, in my, in the back of my head, I was thinking it's another Delenn. She just like saw a, herself from another come time through. Yeah, maybe it's the old Delenn pre oh, transformer wow. or something like that. Like, or or maybe I, I just I didn't know who it was. Like, the idea that it was Anna was like, uh, and I did I did happen to look it up. That was Melissa Gilbert's voice in yeah, that, that episode. You know, which in production world they very much could have had this episode filmed and shot and then just pulled that that clip back over there. I don't mm-hmm. know if they necessarily brought her in just for that one particular show. So, um, like overall, this was an episode where I generally liked all of the individual pieces, but Jeff, I will say, I, I do think that this is an episode folks. I want you to hear me. I liked this episode. I think this is an episode where the individual parts worked better than the whole of the episode did together. The individual parts of the episode are greater than the whole of the episode. If that makes sense. It does. Cause I think I love this episode. Yeah. But also it, I got my note here was there were parts of this episode that were really hard to track that were happening. Like it, it feels like, I don't know if anybody out here, we've talked about what kind of music people like before. And I, and I love those conversations, mm-hmm. but there's a, uh, prog metal kind of super band called sons of Apollo. Right. And, uh, it's got Mike Portnoy on the drums. That's why I'm really into it. But I don't know, like five, six years ago, they released a record called, um, psychotic symphony. And the first track on that record is, uh, so fun. It's a uh, God of the sun. I love playing it on the drums. It's mm-hmm. so challenging. It's so great. But I watched an interview where they were talking about how they wrote it. And they said that like, it was literally just a collection of riffs that was about 10 minutes long. And they sent it over like, Hey, let's, let's uh, work, you know, workshop this and get it down into a song. And they're like, no dude, throw us more riffs and let's just cut these riffs together. So there's like seven different songs, like individual ideas for songs that they string together. Now these guys are galaxy class musicians. I mean, they're incredible. So they make it work. But if you're, I'd say if you're not accustomed to prog music, progressive rock or progressive metal, it's probably pretty disjointed and and jarring. This was sons of Apollo does Babylon five, right? Where it's like, Hey, these are great riffs. These are awesome ideas, but the connective tissue doesn't quite connect. I don't know, but it's still pretty great. I, um, I am just, you know, for, for the record, I know there's a lot of questions out there on my prediction for Anna Sheridan. I am going to hold off on a public statement or any, uh, and answering any questions until next week, because literally all we know right now is it's, uh, someone saying they're Anna Sheridan. It's just someone saying, yeah, we don't actually know that it is Anna, right? Yeah. Yeah. Every reason to believe it is because that's what I've been saying, you know, for, for a long time now, but I mean, what do I know? I'm too biased to even see the good in Dr. Franklin that I said that I saw. So what do I know about Anna? But no, this was great. This is this is this was a good episode, a good penultimate one. I'm excited. Like this did its job. It got me excited to see 
what's going to happen in next week's episode. Well, let's go watch next week's episode. This episode's done. Let's go. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. We we talked about the stuff. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, so. Let's talk about the opening of the episode. Okay. Delenn and Lanier are in the council chambers trying to convince the League of Non-Aligned Worlds to continue to send their their ships. Now, frankly, I thought we had this settled several episodes back when so Sheridan too. brought them all in and everything like that. When Jakar rounded them all up and brought them to the rescue. Yeah, exactly. Like, it happened. Exactly. This like, happened. I mean, you know, there, there's an old vision statement that I know, Jeff, that says vision leaks. You got it. Maybe that's what it is. Like, you got to keep re... Mm -hmm. getting them to re up all the time. I don't know. But, um, they, they, it was a really interesting argument where they said, you got to tell us what's going on. Well, we can't, well, then how are we going to do this? If you don't trust us enough to know what's going on? Well, we can't because that could expose what's really happening. And Delenn appeals to have we ever lied to you? Have, wouldn't we proven ourselves trustworthy? Then trust us now. And they're like, yeah, I'm probably going to need a little more than that. And you know what? I think the league had a point. Mm -hmm. I think they had a very good point. If you don't trust us enough, yes, you're right. The the I the idea of trust in and of itself is that there is risk that this person could betray you. But if you don't trust us enough to tell us what's going on, why should we put our entire home world at risk? by sending these things out to you that you apparently don't even trust us with. And you know what this reminded me of? This reminded me of Veer from last episode and the way Londo was using him and did not trust Veer enough to tell him what was really going on, completely used him. And Veer was like, no, I'm not down for this at all. And I, I think the difference, I, I, I think I, I didn't put that together. I think it's great, but I think the difference and maybe like the difference matters here was Veer has every reason to not trust Londo. Right. You know, time and time again, he's he's cut him off or done something to him. Whereas Delenn was right. Like, this was an interesting scene because both parties were right. You know, mm -hmm. you're asking us to basically sacrifice our home world in exchange for this one last-ditch gambit that we don't understand and you're not telling us about. We need more. Totally makes sense. But then Delenn's like, when have we steered you wrong? Right? Like, we've, we've followed through on every single promise that we've had. And, and, and she even like, if you don't trust us enough to do this, leave, go. Yeah. Like, cause we're not, we're not going to get there, you know, which is a power move, but it was, it, they were both right, you know? And I think Lanier tried to help too, but I think, <laughs> I think in him trying to help, it almost made it worse. He was like, oh, but no, it's cool. It's cool. We also have some really cool other things that we also can't tell you about. Um, but, uh, but it's going to be fine. Cause we have these things that, you know, I mean, come on, just trust us. Please, please. But to me in that scene, what really hit me was Delenn looked very weak and desperate. She didn't look like the leader of the Rangers. Like she was like, come on guys, yeah, oh, yeah. come on. I thought she looked physically tired. Yeah. Which in keeping with last episode and everything that's Makes been sense. going on, it made sense to me. Um, I didn't think weak in terms of, um, I don't know if political power is the right phrase to use with what you're saying there, but I, I get what you're saying. I just passed it off as being tired, but it, that were, does make you look weak. It does. Yeah. If, if I were a league representative and I'm sitting there and we're talking and we're debating and she's comes at us with just let me finish right at that point, I'm done listening. Like you are, I mean, you're 12 years old. Like there's no cogent argument. You don't have control of what's going on. You've, you've completely lost control of it. I think I, I like the outcome of how, how everything came and even where that one drowsy dude, you know, stayed to, to say that we're, we're on board. I liked the outcome, but the execution of this didn't do Delenn any favors. So another spot that i really loved it happened relatively early in the in the episode is the whole thing with garibaldi and the conversation that he had with 
Was it Veer? Or Lanier? Who, who was he talking to? About, uh, he was talking about Franklin being gone. He's talking to Zach. Oh, it was Zach. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, another, the guy who's supposed to join the, the spinoff, right? Uh huh. The, the sidekick spinoff. Right. Uh, I knew it was a sidekick. I just, <laughs> um, one of them, one of them. Was it, it Natoth? I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Well, definitely not Natoth because no. she's fake dead right now. Um, or maybe real dead and fake alive. Whatever. I think real dead. Um, all the way, all the I'm way dead. Okay with that. Unless that other girl comes back to play the part. I'm, I'm cool with it. Yeah. She can stay yeah. with her. Yeah. Um, but Garibaldi is doing something that I have seen so many times. Garibaldi was the guy who tried to step in and help Steven. Garibaldi was the guy who got him to, to realize where he is. And he, Franklin hasn't come around yet. And Garibaldi is sitting there going, couldn't I have done more? Should I have followed him? A, a, an interesting line. Sometimes people walk away because they want to be alone, but sometimes because they want to see if you'll follow them into hell. That's a garbage statement, by the way. Uh huh. Like yep. that is that you're totally trying to justify what you're saying. And when I first heard it, I was like, actually, that's kind of a neat little statement. The more I've thought about it over the last couple of days, I was like, no, yep. that is, well, that is frankly, complete and total bunk. If it's true and that yeah. person is le walking away to see if you follow them into hell, that's not a person you want to follow. That no. is passive aggressive. You need to that, let them that's go. That's toxic. Yeah. That you need to let them go because they got some stuff they got to work out. Yeah. And they need to walk about. It, exactly. Yeah. Um, but he, he, here's the thing. And I loved that, that Garibaldi got to this solution so quickly with the help of his good dear friend, Zachary, um, that you can't be held responsible for other people's actions. Garibaldi did what he needed to do. Steven was the one who had to make the choice of, of where he was going to go from there. And Garibaldi was not responsible for what happened from there. And it's not on him. Steven is responsible for Steven's choices and actions, not Garibaldi. And, uh, like he, he really came to a spot where it seemed like he just sort of let himself off the hook for all of that. But I also appreciated the fact that he he loves and his dear friend so much that it does bother him that he's not back yet. It's a thing he's got to work through. Yeah, it was excellent leadership because to me, like that's the secret to leadership is understanding that we don't you can't make anyone do anything. Right. You can create environments. You can influence. You can say you know whatever, but people are going to make their own choices every time, mm -hmm. and all you can do is be like, even if you're not okay with their choice. You kind of got to be because it's their choice to make. I thought it was fascinating and cool that it was Garibaldi and Zach having the conversation because to peel it back a layer, it's Jerry Doyle and Jeff Conaway who are both people who have been in and out of recovery yeah. their whole life, even at this point, you know, and mm -hmm. arguably were lost as a result of, you know, trying to battle, battle their diseases. And I felt and then that scene and it hit me more the second time than it did the first time, but just how much of them as humans, as actors, you know, people was in that scene right there, because mm -hmm. I guarantee they've had that person, you know, Jerry has had a Garibaldi mm -hmm. before and they, and, and, and Jeff has been a Garibaldi, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like they both sides yep. that was. So it, to me, I, I always get hesitant in television when they start talking about addiction because, I mean, here we are in 2023, almost 2024, mm -hmm. you know, and we're still figuring this stuff out. Right. And so in the 90s, it's like, oh, gosh, but this was great. And I think having people who were there and have lived, have that lived experience added, added a level of credibility that was really important to me. It, and I think it just, it gave them something as actors to draw on that they mm, oh, totally. wouldn't have otherwise had, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I had forgotten about Jeff Conway. I'm always aware of Jared Doyle whenever we get into these scenes. Uh, and, and you're right. They have had times when they're Steven and they've had times when they're Garibaldi, because I got to tell you, uh, the, the quickest person who can spot an addict is another addict. hundred percent. You know, and especially in an addict who's in recovery wants to help all of his friends because if he can get recovery and they can get recovery, then my own recovery not only can be a real thing, but can stay a real thing. Yeah. And that's important to anyone who who's in recovery and living, living that life. By the way, if you guys are out there and you do need any help, uh, please uh, find the help and get the help you need. There is uh, absolutely no shame in that. And uh, there are, 
uh, nearly every community has great recovery programs out there. Just reach out. Yeah, I'm, it, it, one of the things I'm most proud of in my professional career is being able to have, from an administrative standpoint, I mean, I'll own that, but I was able to really support the the, the peer support programs that we've stood up in the state of Oregon that, that I'm really proud of that. Like yeah. it makes a real difference for people. And um, I helped in a small way, but just being able to have done that uh, means it means it means a lot to me to have done that. So yes, please, that helps out there. Uh, Jeff, before we get too far off on the other stuff, I, I want to dive into the Franklin stuff just a just a tad more, if we may. Um, I, okay, one just a complete side note: when he got knifed, that's not a knife. This is a knife, and that th- sucker went into his gullet. My first words were, "Is he leaving the show?" Same, same. I really thought like he was out of the show at that point. And, and I was like, you know, we've heard about how JMS has written, um, uh, trap trap doors doors for all the characters. And I was like, was Franklin's trap door to be killed? Right. I mean, Talia had a pretty cool trap door until we got, yeah, she was dissected. (laughs) Oh, you know, oh my God. Oh, Jeff. I'm still so mad about that. I, I still want evil Talia. I still want evil Talia. And I want what a great time for her to come in. They're recruiting all these telepaths and she shows up. I want, I, I want evil need. Talia to descend upon latent telepath Ivanova and do something like I, I, that's the, that's the story I need anyway. Um, but I want to dive into the, to the conversation that the two Franklins had Mm -hmm. and, and here's what he called him out on it. And I, I, I'm not going to say this verbatim, but Franklin says, look, you use work to run away from your personal life. Then you use stems to run away from work. And now you're running away from everything. And I was like, that is profound. Yeah. Yeah. And fascinating as an analysis of his character. And I kind of want to go back to the beginning. Maybe we'll do this on Babylon five for the second time, but I want to watch this from Franklin. Cause here's what I don't remember. Was Franklin always using stems? Like even from when we first met him or did he just start using stems over the course of the show? I think it was new. In fact, in the quality of mercy, mm-hmm. um, Dr. Julie, what was it? I forget her name. The old lady. Um, yeah, yeah, who was hooked up to the machine? Yeah, that was yeah. her thing. She got dis, uh, you know, had her license revoked for using Sims. And I, and I could be making this up because yes, I'm biased and I can't see the good in Franklin. <laughs> but I think he even like judged her, like, well, you can't use Sims. Like, who are you to do that? Well, yeah, and I Franklin think that we saw that anyway. him. Yeah, we saw him start doing it. And I think that was supposed to have more impact. When it's mm. like, oh my gosh, he's really slipping. I don't I, like at this point. I just feel like he's always been doing Sims since we show since we we first met him but i want to go back and i want to see like i want to track this thread Mm -hmm. with him maybe it actually even has it can recolor the episode grow pose where we met his father yeah you know what i mean like i'm i'm kind of interested to go back and you know that because you know what i don't do very well apparently jeff is i don't do character studies at all at at all i don't i don't do character studies no not at all so uh you know maybe i'll maybe i'll take some people's advice and go start doing character studies out there yeah but they i thought it was neat where they brought up the old stuff right they brought Mm -hmm. up the fact that he um hitchhiked around on on cruisers right the fact that he trashed his notes on minbari biology i didn't did you remember that i didn't remember that one at all was that new information yeah. yeah Yep. Yeah, yeah. We, they talked about all, when he was given his yeah, I hitchhiked around on cruisers. I became an expert on Minbari biology. And when I understood they were going to use my research to hurt people, I destroyed it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is all stuff. And, it was, and then they even referenced the grow pose where they're like, you couldn't be a soldier like your dad. So, so, you, so you ran away into one of the like most difficult other jobs you could ever possibly do. Right. But apparently in his family, like, you know, if you're not a double PhD, you're garbage. Right. So he's still lived up to some expectations, but you know, it makes me wonder is, is Franklin, is he an MD or is he a DO? Oh yeah. And uh, no, no shade to the DOs out there. But yeah. Like, but it's different. It is different. And it can, it, and they both have different connotations among different people. So, and um, what does that even look like? You know, right. in the 23rd century, people out there are Googling, what is a DO? Just, just Google it. You, we, we don't have to discuss it here. Um, but anyway, that was really the Franklin stuff that, yeah. that, that conversation. I like, I really appreciate what you said in your opening thoughts where it's like, he was our voice. Mm-hmm. 
and that, you know, Franklin two or, you know, ghost Franklin, just like all the, literally all the things we've been saying, mm -hmm. he's just like, dude, stop. Yeah. You just stop. Yeah. yeah. And they, and so you're going to go back. I want to go back. I want to do it again, which was a, not my favorite writing line. That's, that's not, you know, you there, could have said there it were some, a few other there were some real holes in the writing Yeah, in this, but yeah. there weren't a lot of holes in the acting. Right. And there wasn't, and there easy. wasn't holes in the intent of what was coming across either. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think Richard Biggs did an incredible job acting against himself. I'm curious, like the, the mechanics, did they have a stand in, you know, for the scenes yeah. or, or how, you know, the, what was the mechanics of You know, it? the but, one thing I did notice and we, you know, I'm watching the remastered versions and stuff is when they went to the split screen, it was way more out of focus and way more fuzzy than any of the other screens. And it didn't, it didn't look good. Like I felt like I could see the composite yeah. uh, out on the edit and, you know, listen on an SD TV in the nineties, it would have been just fine. The scene where stabbed Franklin was starting to climb that ladder yeah. and ghost Franklin was leaning on the rung on the composite. The rungs didn't quite line up. And so like ghost Franklin just looked off, off. Yeah. In the, and it was, it was the same, exactly that where it's just like, this would have been fine on mm -hmm. an old TV, but on this, I can't stop looking at it and it's really distracting me. Right. But the acting, Oh, I've said it many times, Richard Biggs is in, an, I'm consistently blown away by what he brings to Franklin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jeff, I'm not sure what all to really go into. There's the rude woman who's being offensive, walking around as a parent, whatever, whatever. Um, Marcus is completely hitting on Ivanova. Well, I think we said, was it last week? Like, did they just drop that whole storyline? Well, now they brought it back up. I did like his point. He's like, you know, I could teach you Mimbar. He's like, ah, that would take like a year. I just don't have time. And his, his question, I, th I thought it was a really neat question. Oh, well, how old are you going to be in a year if you don't learn Mimbari? And she goes the same age. Like, so get on it. Just do it. Like. There's a cool theme between this and the war without end episodes of time, uh -huh. right? And how like time impacts us. And Zathra said it best, right? He's like, time is infinite. We are finite. Are finite. You yeah. know, it's just how we use that infinite resource. And this was a really great example of that, where it's just like, just if you want to do it, just do it. Go, go. I felt bad though for Marcus. Cause I think, I think that he knows one way or another that like he and Ivanova is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you know she she's in love with with, uh, with pieces that are in a petri dish now somewhere <laughs> in, in a psychor facility and you know that's that's fine it's that's good for her I, I hope Ivanova can make can can get over that like <laughs> yeah. I I'm I'm okay with Ivanova and Marcus getting together because that's a that's a neat couple too it'd be cool yeah. I'd be happy I don't but I feel like in that moment like when he because like he's like I'm gonna I'm, I'm I got a line uh -huh. I got a line I'm gonna use on you but I'm going to say it in Minbari so I can say that I said it, but also I don't have to put myself mm -hmm. out there. Uh, he totally lied to her, by the way. Um, uh, but, we, but what a beautiful lie. It really right? was. Yeah. My words are inadequate to the burden of my heart. Okay. Which poet did JMS lift that line from? I don't know. Well, right. cause I want to go back to like 17 year old Jeff and be like, just say that my words are inadequate and Doors open, dude. She'll be staring at your face all night while you sleep. It'll be amazing. You want to, what, what's the name of that guy that had, uh, oh, Cicero. You want a Cicero, the whole yeah, situation, yeah. right? Inadequate. Just, yeah. That's the word, Jeff. Say that. Right. Right. <laughs> um, uh, then, then there's just the, com the comedic part of Ivanova trying to take a nap. Yeah. Trying to go sleep. She can't sleep. In the sleep. second she gets she comfortable. Fl she flattens the bed, which I'm like. I wonder if Sheridan knew that he could do that when he was trying to sleep on those things. But, but apparently it's an inversion table. Oh, well, I, I, a hundred, I was like, dude, a lot of people pay money for inversion tables and she just got one for free. We have one. Oh, We've got I know one. you do. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We had one for a long time that we got from a friend. They just gave it to us, stood in our attic for years and years and years. And we left it last time we moved. Like whoever, whoever bought our house, we gifted them an inversion table because we're like, we're never using this thing. It's hard to move. Those yeah. things are hard. Yeah. But it's funny, yeah, she gets comfortable. Oh, okay, I've got it figured out. Mm -hmm. Ivanova, to the bridge, to the bridge. Right, and, right. And it was great. You know what, what I love? I love when the military stuff is done right and done well. And that was one of those moments. She didn't be like, oh, she up and ran yeah. right away. She knew what was up. Yeah. Um. And and I, I loved that she was just like, you know what? I'm just going to grab all the pillows and make myself my own little bed. Yeah. 
Like as a as a 1990s latchkey kid who has just grown up with, you know what? Forget it. I'll take care of it myself. I'm just gonna. Uh -huh. I'll do it my way. It's fine. I loved that Ivanova spot. Like, look, fine. I'm gonna do it my way. Forget about it. Um. So there was that. Uh, the space battle stuff was cool. It was okay. I, I've got some questions out of like just about the little shat, the little tiny shadow ships that we've never seen before. We, I feel like we have seen a couple. Have like, we? There's the, there's the big, not those, but I'm saying there's like the big ones. What do we call them? The battle crabs or whatever. Okay. And then there's the littler ones that we've seen a couple of times that are like, I don't know, fighter size or whatever. But there were like these real little ones like that I've never seen before. Thing. Yeah. 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 It didn't, I mean, we saw it at the end, but in the battle, they were doing stuff. Yeah. And, yeah, it was kind of, I, I, I felt like, well, they said they were scout ships or something, right? Yeah. Or something yeah. like that. I don't know, but, but, but it also makes sense. I mean, look at all the different ships, even the Minbari have, you know, so why, why wouldn't the shadows well, have sure. a bunch? I was very underwhelmed with the impact. <laughs> I'm of sorry, the Jeff. It's, oh. the, it's the shadow ships of the line. That's what we need. <laughs> yeah. Right? Is that a book? Is that a thing? <laughs> it is. It's all black pages. though. you can't read it. And once you shine a light on it to read it, shadows go away. And so you yeah. can't actually see it. Right. We should publish that book. There it is. But I was, it's I was just, kind a, of it's just a book of blank pages. Well, yeah, every time you put yeah. the light on it, that shadows go away. It's there though. Goes away. You got to look at it's it in there. the dark. Yeah. Just can't <laughs> see it. <laughs> I was, I was underwhelmed by the impact of the telepaths. Like I yeah. felt like that was going to be a game changer. And we watched that a one-to-one -one ratio between the Minbari and the ships and they crushed them. And in this one, like, eh. eh, yeah, it's, I mean, it didn't feel like one was outnumbering the other. It didn't feel like there was twice as many shadow ships as there were white star fleet battalion league of non-allied world people. Um, it yeah. just, it felt like a space, honestly, it just felt like a space battle where one side was a little stronger than the other mm -hmm. and you know, and then out of nowhere, yeah. out of nowhere it's done. And the army of light wins. Like yeah. I felt like the end was just like, Oh, the oh we army won? of light. Wow. I've I forgot about that phrase. They, they haven't drilled. Like they said that one phrase and you're like, okay, that's so cheesy, but cool. And then like, they haven't really come back to it a lot. Yeah. I, I, I just want to call them the Babylon five forces. There like, you go. They're under the banner of Babylon yeah. five. And that sounds cooler than army of light. The, but the yeah, BFFs? I, I guess they won. They're the BFFs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a t-shirt, Jeff. That's a t-shirt. The BFFs. <laughs> We're going to defeat them with the power of friendship <laughs> forever, <laughs> forever. <laughs> oh. But that all led uh, right to Marcus, not Marcus, but Sheridan, Ivanova mm -hmm. and Delenn kind of debriefing what's going to happen next. Yeah. And Sheridan's like, oh, by the way, I had this vision. Do you have one of those dream interpretation books? Yeah. Can... So what happens when you get stung by a bee in a dream? What does that mean? Yeah. Let's look that up. Okay. So one, the interpretations of these visions were incredibly iffy. Yeah. But the big takeaway I got out of that and is as similar as these visions seem to be to Cisco talking to the prophets. They are not the same thing. This is not Sheridan getting a vision from the gods out there. These are, and they clearly stated it. Kosh gave me these things in my head. Mm -hmm. That's what it, it's coming from Kosh. And I was like, like that completely the, the line that I put of those two things kind of like, eh, it was a little, little, little close, completely separated those. And I know people out there are clacking on the keyboard, keyboards right now. Oh, no, 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 no. Say, save your breath. Uh, but well, well, cause what we know about the Vorlons, we, we watch them go in and manipulate Jakar. Yeah. We we've heard about manip we saw what's his face uh, Jack the Ripper yeah you know that they used for should have had things. King Arthur in the right way but they messed up on that one Met, yeah they couldn't they couldn't the follow one that bad story. episode of season three Jeff that literally literally it won. might be the only actual bad episode of season three but in the end it was just like oh okay so this is this is a Vorlon Kosh manipulation like everything else that we've seen, but we're just not going to call it that. And, and I think to me, with my, my problem, like you said, the interpretations were iffy. And I think they even said them in iffy ways because they're mm -hmm. like, 
you know, uh, a, do you know who I am? And it's like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm a telepath. Okay. Next. Like, like, I don't, oh, I don't and then there was the this image of me in a psych or thing. Well, now we're working with Bester, so that makes sense. Yeah, that, that's like, why you were in a psych op. What? Yeah, right? Really? The one that got me, the one that got me more than anything else was the you are the hand. You are the hand. It's like, well, there's also this other one that says you have two hands and they're equal and opposite, and there's the man in between. So the man in between is your equal and opposite. Like, no, no, I'm sorry. There is another vision out there of I see a great hand reaching out across the universe and we see a hand. And you go, Sheridan is the hand. Mm -hmm. That's where, like, when you when you went to, well, there's an equal and opposite hand and that's what the man in between is and that's what it meant to say you are the hand. Like, what? What? I felt what? like I wanted to be like, hey, hey, Delenn, I want you to, this is what I want you to do. I want you to pause this conversation. Go talk to Lanier. Because Lanier was able to piece together a logic puzzle that told Sheridan about Naroon coming to kill you without ever telling Sheridan that Naroon was coming to right. kill you. Lanier needs to have this conversation with you. You are not up to the task. <laughs> right. You're you're emotionally compromised right now. Yeah, that, that um, whole thing just it felt uh, it felt forced. It felt drawn out, and I don't I don't understand. Outside of saying there's this equal and opposite Sheridan, outside of that, I'm like, what was? What was the, well, so point? here, here's my theory on that. And this honestly brings up my final thoughts on this episode. This was foreshadowing of Anna. Anna is Sheridan's equal and opposite. Oh, wow. And you know, it, she's going to be around, I guess now through, you know, season four, whatever is left of this war mm -hmm. of, of the shadows. Um, and, and it's pretty clear to me, at least I would think that you know here's sheridan leading the army of light and it's going to be anna not morden anna leading the army of darkness against each other and they're as former husband and wife they are equals but opposites of each other you thought kramer versus kramer was bad sheridan <laughs> versus, versus sheridan. sheridan takes down the whole galaxy <laughs> <laughs> wow I like that. I, I hadn't even considered that. I figured like, I'm like, man, in between, I literally was like, it, was the Psycop Sheridan in the vision, not a bester thing, but like there's literally an evil doppelganger version of Sheridan over on the, like waiting at Zaha Doom, like in a pod, you know, or whatever. Like that was, I, I like, I like the Anathot better. So the one thing they still haven't explained though, is why does everybody have birds on their shoulders? Yeah. Uh, they, did, they didn't <gasps> explain that. What? Oh, did you figure it out? What is it? What if they're keepers? Oh, it, but, it's like, a vision, it, were, but these are visions from Kosh. Uh huh. These are visions from Kosh. Like they're warnings. Uh, Garibaldi and Ivanova are going to get keepered, and he's oh, not telling. No, he's what not if, no, 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 no. Flip it around. Flip it around. Flip it around. So you got the keepers that are taking on the bad guys. What if the birds are like the good keepers? Like they're okay. the vor like the spirit. Oh, there you go. here's your Catholic thing. The spirit of the dove in the form of a dove descending uh -huh. upon you. Garibaldi had a literal dove. Yeah, he had, the holy had a raven, spirit. You know, holy ghost sitting like, right there. Like what if it's it's the positive version of that? Wow. Oh man. Who am I? Well, you are a force of light. That's who you are. There you go. Like let's bring that out and do those things. Oh, yeah. Cause I think they were even on the same shoulder as Londo's the keeper was on, I think. No, I think they're on opposites. No, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm putting it theory. in my head right now. And I'm pretty sure Londo's was on his right. And for Ivanov and Garibaldi, the bird it was, was on, on the left. left. That supports your oh, theory. Cause little, then it's a devil, on, devil one side, angel angel on, on the side. other. Oh my yeah. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Brent, I think we've reached that point of mm -hmm. our conversation where we're going to boil this all down. We're going to see if this episode had any of that Star trek -y quality to it, if it has a great moral message, if it's holding up a mirror to society or any of those things that great art and sci-fi tends to do. I'm going to do that by rating this on a scale of zero to five deltas as to just how Star trek -y this episode was. You have the responsibility of rating this on a scale of zero to five star theories as to how much we liked it and how Babylon five the episode was. I'm going to go first and I'm going to be honest. I have, I've got some stuff here, but not a whole lot. And I think to me, 
the Franklin conversation with Franklin was through and through the message in this episode. There are a couple other pieces that we talked about in there, but what I loved about their conversation was what ghost Franklin essentially said was Steven for your whole life. You have lacked self-awareness your whole life. And you've reacted to things and made life altering decisions based on you running away from things that you don't have this, the courage or the self-awareness to actually see. Okay, cool. Like that's, that's awesome. But then they added to it and they're like, get up, climb that ladder, go. And if you want this, go do the things you have to do to do it. Because Brent, the cool thing about life, like the amazing thing is we're not stuck. We can change. Mm -hmm. We can get better. We can also get worse, but we can change. And all it needs is self-awareness for that. And if you don't have the self-awareness, have the trust to listen to someone who will be honest with you and tell you those things. Franklin had had people telling him this. He had Garibaldi, his friend saying, dude, look in a mirror, look at what you're doing. And he wasn't hearing it, but when he heard it from him, when he had that inner voice, tell him a thing, you can't argue with yourself, right? I mean, you can, and probably do quite a bit, but in the end you're like, wow, I'm right about this. It's incredible. And I think it's one of the superpowers we as humans have is that ability to adapt and that ability to grow and that ability to change as a father. I often look at my daughter, right? And I want great things for her. She is eight years old, right? I barely remember things from when I was eight years old. If I look back at myself, the person I was when I was eight, the person I was when I was 18, 28, 38, 48, those are all different people. I changed, I grew, and that's a good thing. If you're not growing, if you're not changing, in fact, I think it was Spock who said that our ability to change is the thing that truly makes us great. He had a better way of saying it. I remember it off the top of my head, but that, that, that awareness and that ability to change is what makes us amazing. Loved the message. It was a huge part of this episode. I'm going to give this one three deltas based on that. What are you thinking for star Furies? Well, uh, you know, star Furies. Th there's two aspects to it really how much did we enjoy the episode and and how babylon 5 was this episode is kind of what we say i want to i want to tackle those separately and then maybe do a little compositing here um how how much did we enjoy this episode I, i'm going to go back to what we said at the beginning i think this was a good episode but the individual parts were far greater than this episode as a whole which actually knocks the enjoyment of the episode down. Yeah. Like, and uh, like, hear me folks, we liked the episode, but as a whole, it wasn't as strong as the individual pieces. And that pulls the whole thing down a little bit. So I'm actually on that basis alone. This one is going to get three star furies. That's okay. not a bad rating. That's, that's a, mm -hmm. that's a very Midland, not a bad episode. I will watch this episode. Anytime I see it come on TV. I'm not, you know, it, I'm not going to change the channel. I'll watch it. But I think the, the, the Franklin piece was super strong. The space battle piece with Ivanova and Marcus was really strong. Garibaldi, uh, was, was really strong. The Delenn and Sheridan, um, you know, advancing that piece. those concepts all together in one episode, that's really disjointed. You know what I mean? Um, but Jeff, if, as far as how Babylon five, if you'll, if you'll permit me and you can tell me no, but if you'll permit me, I actually want to jump back, jump back to your deltas. Okay. Because you, you talk about the Franklin piece and that certainly is where the message lies. Everything you said, Star Trek wouldn't do it that way though. Oh no. no. Babylon five would do it this way. And Jeff, if, if you'll permit me, I'll give this three star furies, but I would actually like to take your delta how many deltas did you say three i want to take your three deltas and i want to change those to delta furies because i think everything you said is absolutely right but i will addendum to that it was done in a very babylon five way yeah and it's a those are i'm gonna i want to give those just some delta furies as they are 
I think that makes a lot of sense. I love that. And it kind of composites the enjoyment and the message because I mean, we're really, we're really hitting this in, in, in a, in a way I think we're, I think we're landing in a place. I'll just say that. Yeah. I think that we have under, come to come to we've come to understand that despite what many people in the community have said, Babylon Five is replete with Star Trek messages that overflowing with Star Trek messages. There are people out there who have told us that looking at this uh, series through a Star Trek lens is negatively impacting our enjoyment. I say no. Mm -hmm. I think it's enhancing ours and many people's in the community. Yep. But we've come to understand, I think we're coming to understand that I'm going to wrestle with this a little bit. Um, not here now, because you don't want to listen to me talk out loud about this, think out loud about this, but yeah, there's the message, but Babylon five is its own thing. Yeah. And it does this, it, it imparts these messages in a very strong and unique way. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hey, you're not done though. Hope you haven't punched out because oh. now you have a, a near what, what's going to, what is becoming. You now have what is becoming a near impossible task. We, like in last season, mm -hmm. are developing the definitive, objectively correct ranking of all the episodes in this season, in the third season, a season that we just earlier said has had only one bad episode mm. so far. Brent, you need to rank this bad boy. Yep. Our current top five, War Without End Part 2, War Without End Part 1, Severed Dreams, Point of No Return, and then Ship of Tears. Brent, where does Shadow Dancing go? Okay, so the dividing line of this episode, of this season, sorry, I'm looking at the overall ranking. The dividing line of this season to me goes all the way down to where we have uh, the, the top five, and then we have Messages from Earth, The Rock Cried Out, No Hiding Place, Interludes and Examinations, then Passing Through Gus Enemy. Passing through Gus Enemy, you and I have said was the that is the episode that defined this season, mm -hmm. set this season on its ear, and the season is sort of revolved around many of these themes that we found out of passing through Gus Enemy. So that kind of that's my immediate line right there. The next episode is Gray Seventeen is missing, which I will remind people we will revisit this. We will have a chance to adjust this quite a bit. Um and then we have Matters of Honor and Voices of Authority, which that was the episode with Chicky in it, uh, Dust to Dust about the drugs and Sick Transit Veer and then Walkabout and Day in the Strife and Convictions and Exogenesis, which I thought was a great episode. That's it's the one fun. with the bug. Uh, Ceremonies of Light and Dark, which I didn't really understand, but it was there. And then that one episode we don't talk about. Um, all good episodes. I don't think this one cracks passing through guest enemy to me. Okay. I like, again, I like the individual pieces, putting them together and viewing it as a whole. It just didn't work for me on that level. Uh, so I, I'm not placing it up there, but I do think that this is objectively better than gray 17 is missing. So yeah. I'm going to place this between passing through guest enemy and gray 17. This is our new number 10. This is a top 10. People want to yell at me guys. This is a top 10 episode. Top 10 might be top 11 by the time we're done with next week. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, I, I, that's, I'm not gonna lie. You're going to, you're going to, th there are people that are, have just like their, their brains literally have exploded. Oh, like, oh, not, I, oh, not, the, the, the messages that we've got in comments and stuff since gray 17 and missing are, are frankly hilarious and a bit disturbing <laughs> a little bit. So, but yeah, I think, I think you literally just took kind of like the accelerant that was laid down by people's <laughs> feelings on that. And you just boom, dropped a match. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, um, I can't, Listen, I just want to say grace of as of, as of next week, gray 17 will officially be in the bottom half of the season. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just assuming so. that the season finale is going to be one of the top rated episodes. Just making a guess. Wouldn't that be wild if we're just like season finale, worst, worst episode ever. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like thinking. Real, in real time, we could watch our subscriber and follower counts drop off. <laughs> just be like, they're like, nope. Nope. See you next There's time. no hope for you after this one, guys. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, Brent, that's it for shadow dancing. Mm -hmm. Next week, we're watching the season three finale. Mm. It is appropriately named, I'm going to assume, based on everything we've seen so far, mm. Zaha Doom. That's mm. what we know about it. We mm -hmm. know what we've watched in three seasons. In the title of this episode, we haven't looked ahead. We haven't read any synopses. We haven't looked at thumbnails, anything. And the fun game we love playing here on Babylon 5 for the first time is guessing what the next episode will be based on the title alone. 
Brent, what do you think Zaha Doom is going to be all about? Well, uh, honestly, Jeff, um, I I don't want to. Pre- I never want to put on airs when we when we come here. Just we'll own right where we are. This is a title that you and I both noticed several weeks ago. Yes, like you you we try not to look at the upcoming titles and different things like that, but sometimes things just jump out at you and stick in your memory. And well, us- and we had to. We have to plan some oh, things. Sure. And when we get getting to the end of the season, uh, literally here, I brought up yeah. the titles of episodes. Titles so, yeah, of episode. we've had exactly. a little, little bit. E- exactly. And so, you know, you and I talked a little bit off microphone about like, hey, yeah, the, the, did you see the final episode title? Yeah. it's all, So I've been thinking about it for a couple of weeks now. Um, so I, I'd say that just to say, this is not me coming up with this off the fly, right? There's one message that we keep hearing about, and, and we've heard about it a little bit since we've known this. Uh, and we've heard it, I don't know, Jeff, three, four, maybe five times now. There is something about Sheridan going to Zaha Doom or not going to Zaha Doom. And in this one, we're going to figure out what that's all about. Um, I think Anna has come back. She clearly was that thing that launched out of the shadow ship and has come in and she's shadow lady right now. Yeah. She is going to tempt John to go. And Delenn is going to be sitting there saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. Um, I think there's the piece inside of Sher- the, the piece of Kosh that is now inside of Sheridan who is actually going to make him go. Like Sheridan is going to feel like he has this protection because of Kosh. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like, uh, cause, cause when Kosh was saying, uh, if you go to Zahodum, you'll die. I, my, my interpretation of that was if you go to Zaha doom, you'll die. If I don't go with you. Well, now that Kosh is inside him, Kosh is going to go. So now oh. it's time for him to go to Zaha doom. Right. Okay. But Delenn is just like, I don't think Delenn's ever going to understand this move. And the, the sacrifice that they talked about being made and all of this stuff, Jeff, this is also the season finale of season three. JMS is writing this whole narrative arc. We're at this climax. We're getting, we're getting ready to, to, to slide down the, the backside of it. Narratively speaking, do you know what happens at this point in the story? It all falls apart. The this worst the thing possible. Yeah. The worst thing possible is what happens at this particular point in the story. Because then this is how they have to overcome it in, in, in the end, right? This is where the falling action comes into place. Right? So, um, I, yeah, I, I, I compared it to, uh, I think last week, um, Han Solo going into carbonite. Exactly. Right. And Dumbledore falling off the tower. And I guess there's another one I had. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it, it's, it's Moana deciding to go back. She's going to quit her journey and go back home. It's it getting that disc- like it's it's that moment. Um Sheridan's gonna get captured. Sheridan Sheridan's gonna be out of the game for a while. Yeah. Stuff's stuff's gonna happen with Sheridan in this one by going to Zaha Doom. And I I Yeah, I don't know what. I just, this is a, this is bad stuff is getting ready to happen. That's all I'm going to say. Bad stuff is happening and it's Sheridan fighting whether or not to go back to Zaha Doom. What do you think? What do you want, John? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> I, I I think we line up on a couple of things, but I think that Anna, Mordenized Anna, mm-hmm. is going to, like she'll be pressuring him to go mm-hmm. to Zaha Doom, but she's going to do it by asking what he wants. And he's going to, you know, I, I want the shadow threat destroyed. I want these things. I want peace. I want all this stuff. And then she's like, then come to Zaha Doom. Like I'll do it. Like she's not going to lure him like in a, you know, like, do it or die kind of a thing. It's going to be like, come on, we're, we're going to help you do all the stuff. We're going to go. But I think, um, I think that Kosh is going to be right. And I think that this one is going to have, it's going to end on two fronts. And front number one is going to be, I think Sheridan is going to die. Mm-hmm. But I don't necessarily think he's going to die in the way we think. We've had um, a concept that has dropped in a handful of times and they basically did an episode that we said was the basis for the theme of this whole season passing through Gethsemane based on the death of personality. 
And so I think that we might see something more uh, metaphorical as a death for Sheridan. Okay. But I, I but I agree, he's going to be out of the game for a while. Like this is going to take him off the board for some time. And this is going to be the best of both worlds moment at the end. This isn't a two-parter from what I understand. It's not Zaha Doom part one, and then season four picks up with Zaha Doom part two. I don't know the so name. This, so this is not a, a best of both worlds part one and two, we're going to ruin your summer type situation. I think it is going to be that. Oh, I think do. it is going to be, but I think, but I think it's because what we what we've seen in uh, the the season finales is they end and then they just kind of pick up with another episode, you know, in, in the in the season opener. I think though the fire moment of this is going to be people don't know what's up with Sheridan necessarily. Maybe he's fallen out of comms or something, but they're going to be doing business as usual, and all of a sudden, like. 40 shadow ships are going to pop out of nowhere, surround Babylon 5, and then it's going to fade to black, and we're going to see Doug, Douglas Netter's name pop up on the screen, and we're going to be like, what? And you know the part of that that's going to suck the most, Jeff? Is we don't get to press play and go on to the next episode because next the, the week after next week is the season three wrap-up. We don't get to yeah. go to season four till after that. We cannot watch where we're, people are asking. We're not allowed to watch season four, episode one until after we do our season three wrap up. Correct. And in fact, I want to I want to shout out our our incredible support and good friend Nia, who uh, you get to know if you're on our mm -hmm. Patreon discord discord. But a while ago, Nia provided me with the instrumental music for the intros to season three and season four. We get so into, I don't we get to, new music. Yeah, oh, I'm excited. Season. I'm excited to hear new music. OK, cool. But I. I don't have to go look for that. So I'm not going to have any sort of tease, any sort of idea that I had a little bit of Nia's coming into season three because I had to find. So yeah, Nia's, Nia's got her back. Nia's She's the best. Incredible. She's cool. But um, we're going to find out next week what Zaha Doom is all about. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. If you haven't already, please follow or subscribe wherever you're listening or watching us and leave us a review, not just because we love it. We absolutely love it when you leave reviews, but we're doing a giveaway in two weeks, two weeks time. We got a review. We're going to pull it out. We're going to give away two star theories and all you got to do to make that happen, to get your chance for it is leave us a review. So Brent until next hey, time. Jeff. Yeah, man. What's up? Okay. Let's go. I'm, I'm going to go watch this episode. Let's go. Just forget. All let's this. do it. Peace, victory, long life. It's my first time. Did you Club think I was actually gone? What's up? Oh. I'm, yeah, we're good. I'm dead serious. Let's go watch. Okay. Do you have anything for Club 65? No, love you guys, Club 65. No, I gave you all of my notes. I don't have anything left over for them. So you cool. guys are right. Hey, get your t-shirts. We'll talk to you next time. Zahadoom. Let's go. See you. I got to hit end. You got to hit end. <laughs> we got to go. I was like. That's right.